Ruth Benedict was a anthropologist who worked at uh, Columbia University uh, in the early to mid 20th century. She was born, I believe, in the 1880s and passed away uh, just around 1950. I'm not sure the exact year. Um, she was uh, perhaps the leading anthropologist of the day when she was around, the most important anthropologist doing work. Uh, and she is uh, uh, one of the most important anthropologists for within the history of the discipline. Um, she uh, is widely credited with starting or being one of the major originators of what has come to be called anth uh, cultural anthropology. And so if you take an uh, uh, anthropology class and you had a unit or whatever you're taking a class on, cultural anthropology, she was one of the first people to really begin doing that. And she really kind of made cultural anthropology into a discipline. So very, very important um, within anthropology and within the, the history of that discipline. <clears throat> now, what we're going to be reading, what we're concerned with, is not so much what she has to say about anthropology, because <clears throat> this is an ethics class, uh, but with what she has to say about ethics. And Ruth Benedict and uh, kind of anthropology, the cultural anthropology in particular, that discipline, especially kind of um, during Ruth Benedict's time and then immediately following, uh, put forward what has come to be called cultural relativism, which was, is a uh, certain view about the nature of ethics. And Ruth Benedict and other such anthropologists thought that their anthropological investigations of various cultures supported something like cultural relativism. Now, Ruth Benedict herself doesn't use that phrase, cultural relativism. You don't find it. Um, but nonetheless, <clears throat> what we're going to see is that she puts forward that view. So before we turn to... Um, what exactly uh, she writes and says, right? Before we turn to her article, Anthropology and the Abnormal, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about terminology. <clears throat> so this idea of cultural relativism, what exactly is cultural relativism? What is it that she is uh, allegedly supporting or putting forward? Cultural relativism is the idea, as you might, you might draw just from the name of the theory or whatever, that morality is relative to culture, right? And those two words are there, relative and culture. Okay. Well, what exactly does that mean? The idea is something like this. According to cultural relativism, an action is morally right or morally wrong, whichever one you're looking at, um, if and only if the culture says so. What it is to be morally wrong is simply the culture's deeming it so, right? The culture disapproving of an action or behavior. So for example, in our culture, uh, sleeping with your neighbor's spouse, adultery, is considered morally wrong. It's morally wrong in our culture, a cultural relativist would say. Why? Well, because the culture disapproves of it, right? It's wrong according to us, according to our culture. But in a different culture, right, and this is where the, the anthropological investigations are going to come into play, but in other cultures, they don't disapprove of that kind of behavior. In other cultures, sleeping with your neighbor's spouse might not be disapproved of. They might think that it's a normal part of life or, or, or whatever, right? They might not disapprove of it. And so, according to the cultural relativist, adultery is not wrong. It's not morally wrong over there. Yeah, it's not morally wrong relative to that culture. It's not morally wrong if you're over there. It's only morally wrong here where our culture disapproves of it. What this entails is that there is no objective morality, right? Actions are only ever morally right, right or wrong relative to the culture, which you're concerned with. 
There is no overarching, universal, objective morality. There's only ever the moralities of particular cultures. Actions can only ever be morally wrong for some particular culture. And so to the question, well, is adultery morally right or wrong? The cultural relativist would say, well, um, it's morally wrong in our culture. It's morally right in that other culture. And that's all there is to it. There is no answer to the question, is it morally wrong, period. There is no such thing as being morally wrong, period. There's only ever morally wrong for this culture or for that culture, right? An action simply can't be morally wrong, period, right? Morality is relative to culture. When you unpack this idea, what, there, what cultural relativism really is putting forward is this idea that there is no objective, universal, what I call here, transcultural standard of morality. There's no transcultural universal code of morality. All that there are are uh, particular moral codes. There's the moral code of our society. There's the moral code of that society over there. There's the moral code of this culture from the past. And none of them are more moral or more correct than any other ones. To make a judgment like that would require that there be some transcultural standard of morality, according to which that culture over there, you know, it matches more closely that transcultural standard than ours. And so they're better than us from a moral standpoint. Doesn't work. That's impossible. There is no transcultural standard of morality according to cultural relativism. It doesn't work according to cultural relativism, right? That's the view. And I trust that this view might be somewhat familiar. You may have heard things like this before, yeah? That's the view that someone like Benedict is going to put forward. That's cultural relativism. Now, a related view that might be even more prevalent in uh, uh, today's society, among people today, is what I'm just going to call individual relativism. And it's exactly like cultural relativism, Except instead of saying that morality is relative to the culture of which you're a part, instead we say, no, morality is relative to the individual. And so I'm calling it individual relativism to pick up um, on, uh, you know, to pick up on the fact that we call cultural relativism, cultural relativism. Uh, but individual relativism goes by any number of names. <clears throat> Some people call it moral relativism. Some people call it ethical relativism. Uh, some people call it subjectivism. Some philosophers, I should say. Yeah, I don't think anybody, normal people talk like that. Um, but uh, moral relativism, that might be the most common expression. Moral relativism, maybe somebody means cultural relativism when they say moral relativism, but typically more often than they not, they mean something like individual relativism. And so individual relativism would be more or less exactly like cultural relativism, except instead of relativizing moral claims to one's culture, they're relativized to the individual. And so an action is morally right or wrong, if and only if the individual believes it to be so, right? And so if you believe that sleeping around on your spouse is morally wrong, well, then it is for you. But if you don't, if you think sleeping around on your spouse is not morally wrong, well, then it's not for you. Yeah, that's the idea right? What's moral, what's morally right or wrong depends upon you. And so I have my own morality and you have your own. And 
I'm no more right than you are. They're, we just have different moralities, right? And it'd be a mistake to think that my morality is better or more moral. In order to judge my morality as more moral, I would need some trans, uh, well, trans individual standard of morality. I would need some objective, universal code of morality by which I could compare my morality to your morality. But there is no such objective universal code of morality, right? All there is, is my particular code and your particular code and his particular code and hers. And no code is more right than any other. They're just different, right? And so according to these kinds of relativism, <clears throat> Uh, morality is somewhat akin to um, taste. Uh, so in the same way that uh, uh, I might say, uh, you know, what, I don't know, garlic is super tasty. I really like garlic in food and whatever, yeah. Well, it's super tasty for me. That doesn't mean it's super tasty, period. Some people hate garlic, right? And so for them, it's not super tasty. By contrast, uh, I think uh, uh, black licorice, that flavor, uh, what is it, uh, uh, anise, anise, I don't know how you say it. I, I find that absolutely disgusting. I don't understand how anybody can make food with that flavor in it, but people do. I find it absolutely revolting. Uh, well, fine. It's absolutely revolting to me and to you. You might have all kind of messed up taste buds or whatever. You might not be quite right in the head. And so you like it. I don't know. Right. Well, whatever. Right. It's, so it's tasty to you. It's not to me. There's no objective fact of the matter. It's just how it appears to you and how it appears to me. And that's it. That's all there is to say about it. And if we were to start arguing you know, about tastes, but we were to start arguing about, um, you know, ice cream flavors, vanilla is the best. And you say, no, 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 pistachio is, I mean, that's just silly. It's like, I like vanilla more. You like pistachio more. That's all there is to it. There's no objective right answer as to which is better, right? The idea behind these relativisms, cultural and individual, is that morality works in exactly the same way. There's no objective fact of the matter about what's morally right or wrong. Different cultures have different codes or different individuals have different codes. No code being more correct or more moral than any other. That's cultural relativism and individual relativism. Now, what we're going to focus on is cultural relativism, because that's what Benedict talks about. That's what the subsequent article we're going to be reading uh, by Rachel's talks about. But everything said about cultural relativism, both in Benedict and Rachel's, I trust you'll be able to see could equally be said about individual relativism if you make the necessary changes, right? You'd have to change up examples and you'd have to change up what exactly the claims are, but uh, they work in very similar ways. And so uh, we're going to focus on cultural relativism, but Whatever arguments for it and against it we encounter, I think you, you'll be able to see, and I'll talk a little bit about, how they could also be arguments for or against individual relativism. All right, so with this kind of terminology in the background, let's turn to Benedict. So Benedict spends most of the article, <clears throat> most of the selections that we're reading, going through examples of different cultures. Uh, drawn from different cultures. So she's particularly concerned with this concept of the normal and the abnormal, these concepts, normal and abnormal. She thinks they're related to ethics, that uh, they, these are ultimately ethical uh, concepts or morally loaded concepts. And so uh, they're going to have implications for morality, but we'll see that in a little bit. Uh, but she spends most of her time giving these examples of different cultural practices, cultural practices that are very different from how we uh, do things. So we in what, you know, 20th, 21st century uh, Western world, something like that, right? <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on two of them. So one of the examples she gives is drawn from uh, the Melanesian culture. 
So there was an anthropologist whose last name was Fortune who went over and uh, lived with these people, saw how they lived, and kind of documented his findings. This is how they go about doing things. This is, these are their mores and customs and blah, 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 and so on. And these are how they're kind of, this is how they are expected to act. This is what would be normal in that culture. This is what would be abnormal. Now, the reason Benedict talks about this culture is because they seem very different uh, in a particular respect from us. So according to Benedict, what she's telling us, um, their normal is very different from ours. So in this culture, uh, there was intense suspicion of, of your neighbors, of neighbors. Um, the members of this culture suspected that their neighbors were trying to poison them or steal from them or whatever. They were always suspecting that their uh, neighbors kind of had it out for them. And so what was normal in this culture was to kind of be distrustful of your neighbors, to be kind of standoffish, to remain kind of uh, in solitude and alone, to be disagreeable to your neighbors, to be kind of mean to them, not help them out at all, right? Because they, because of their distrust, they saw people who would try to help out. That was kind of, um, yeah, are you just trying to poison me? Are you just trying to, right? So they didn't, they, you didn't help anybody. That was not what you did. This was what was normal. This was how, this was the normal course of events. Now, in this culture, what Fortune, the anthropologist who went over there, uh, saw was that there was a guy, a fella, who wasn't like that who just, I guess, just by kind of natural disposition, didn't act like that, couldn't bring himself to act like that. He was the abnormal one. This guy would, uh, he just couldn't help it. He tr helped people out, tried to. He was very kind and very pleasant, very kind of sunny disposition. Yeah, very pleasant, nice fella. In their culture, this guy was seen as you know, bonkers, abnormal. What is wrong with that guy? That's not how you're supposed to act. And so, and, I, and so the idea is supposed to be, Benedict's idea, this is a kind of inversion of how we do things, right? If we saw someone who is just very kind of disagreeable and solitary and mean and just wouldn't help anybody out and just grumpy and blah, right? We think, oh, that guy, I don't know about that guy. That's not how you want to be. That's, that, that's a, that guy's a weirdo. It's by contrast, in our culture, right? Someone who is helpful and kind and sunny and, oh, hello and whatever, right? That's, yeah, be like that. That's good. That's normal, yeah? And so we're like a mirror image of the Melanesian culture. The Melanesian culture is a mirror image of us, yeah? What they call normal, we call abnormal. What they call abnormal, we call normal. That's one of Benedict's examples. The second example that I'll refer to as we kind of proceed is uh, drawn from this civilization, the Kwakiutl civilization, which was a group of uh, Native Americans off in the Pacific Northwest. Um, <clears throat> and she tells this story. So uh, this civilization, this culture, had uh, a way of grieving their dead or dealing with um, uh, misfortune, call it that. Uh, and in particular, uh, the, the story that uh, Benedict tells, it's misfortune that, arise, uh, that concerns kind of the death of loved ones. So she tells this story that there's this Kwakiutl chief. <clears throat> Well, so before I begin, the basic idea is something like this. They have a much, much different way of grieving than we do. They have a much, much different way of responding to the death of loved ones, to those kinds of misfortunes than we do. Uh, very different, right? They don't sit around and cry and have a funeral or something like that. They do something really different. And this story reveals what they do. Okay, so the story is something like this. Um, a Kwakiutl chief, um, like I think it's his sister and, uh, you know, his sister's daughter. So that'd be what, or his niece or something like that, or nephew, I don't know, something like that. They go somewhere, they travel on a boat somewhere, and they never return with the obvious implication being that they die 
right? Uh, they don't know exactly how they die. Maybe it's a boating accident. Maybe it's something else. But Chief's sister dies. <clears throat> the Kwakiutl perceive that or perceived that as a kind of insult to the chief, right? The world is insulting the chief, right? And they have, and they have this kind of pride where they won't stand by being insulted. And so the chief, in response to this insult from the world, uh, organizes a war party. And what the chief does is he goes out and he finds some other people to pass his grief onto. And does that mean he sits down with them and chats and has a good cry about it? No, 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 it doesn't mean that at all. The war party kills these other people. Um, you know, they find uh, a half dozen people, a couple of whom were children, just out there somewhere. And they kill them to pass that grief on, to pass that insult on. You know, he says at one point, me, the chief, I am not going to be the one to wail. I am not going to be the one to grieve. I'm passing that on. Right? And there's no belief, right? There's no, you might think, well, maybe they thought these half dozen people or so were somehow responsible for the chief sister's death. Nope, not at all. They know full well that these people had nothing, no responsibility, nothing to do with um, the death of the sister. They do it to pass the grief on, to pass the insult on. They're not going to be the ones to cry. Your loved ones can cry. I'm passing the grief on. Something like that. That's how this civilization dealt with death. Very, very, very different from our civilization, right? So this is another example that Benedict uses, and we're going to talk about these examples as we proceed. Now, uh, so those are two examples. Uh, there are other ones in there, uh, whatever you've read them. She uses these examples to support cultural relativism. And you get a statement of cultural relativism right here on page 73, right? So she says something like the following. We no longer make the mistake of deriving the morality of our own locality and decade directly from the inevitable constitution of human nature. What does that mean? What she's saying there is we no longer make the mistake of thinking that our moral code is the one true objective moral code. We don't make that mistake. We, I don't know who the we is. Uh, we anthropologists, we enlightened people, we educated, I have no idea who I'm saying. We Westerners, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but we no longer make that mistake. We recognize that morality differs in every society. And morality, moral, whatever, is simply a convenient term for socially approved habits. Mankind has always preferred to say it is morally good rather than it is habitual. And the fact of this preference is matter enough for a critical science of ethics, but historically, the two phrases are synonymous. To say that something is morally good is simply to say that it's habitual. And what does that mean? To say that it's socially approved, that it's what, this, it's what people in this society do. It's what people in this culture do. What we do, what we approve of and so regularly do, that's just what it is for something to be morally good. Morality simply, or the moral code simply consists of socially approved habits. And so whatever is socially approved, whatever we habitually do and so approve of, that's morally right. Whatever socially approved of is morally right. But what she's just been showing us for the whole entirety of the article up until this point is that different habits are socially approved in different cultures. And so the implication is that morality is different in different cultures. And there's no one true objective morality out there. There's just different morality. So there's our morality, and then there's the Kwakiutl morality, and there's the Melanesian morality. And no one of these moral codes is superior to any other. They're just different, right? 
that's Benedict's cultural relativism. What we're going to do now with the Rachel's article, uh, so in a subsequent video and subsequent videos, is we're going to examine cultural relativism in more detail. Uh, and we're going to take a kind of critical eye to it, seeing whether or not its claims hold up.